Praise in this place. He alone is worthy. He alone is worthy. Come on, why don't you find your seat this morning? Enoch, why don't you hang out for just a moment? Thank you. We're going to get right into the word. Thank you, Pastor DeAndre. John chapter 1. It reads like this. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through Him. This is speaking of Jesus. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. His name is Jesus. He is the light that shines in the darkness. The darkness cannot overwhelm it. It cannot snuff it out. It cannot extinguish it because everything that has life comes from the light of Jesus. Thank you, Enoch. Today, I wanna to share a message called Be Here. Be Here. Turn to somebody and say, I'm here. I'm here, I'm here. Last week we shared a message called Be Humble, which if you missed it, you can catch up on YouTube or on our Saints Church podcast. Uh, it's a good way to keep in touch, whether it's on Spotify, on iTunes, wherever you find your podcast. You can find an audio version or find us on YouTube, or if you're watching online on the live stream, welcome. We're so glad that you're with us. Once again, my name is Brett. I'm the pastor here at Saints Church, and uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be your pastor. And it is a privilege to follow Jesus and not to not only do that uh, myself, but to do that with you. Uh, because let me let you in on a little like leadership secret. The whole plan here is to just follow Jesus one step at a time. That's the plan. That's the vision. That's the direction. That's the purpose. That's what we do. You're like, oh, there must be strategy. Sure. We've got strategies. We have to be wise. We have to be good stewards and we got to be wise. But ultimately, we go where Jesus leads us, and we do what he asks us to do when he asks us to do it. And uh, that is what church is all about. But beyond just church, that's what following Jesus is all about. As an individual, I boldly follow Jesus one step at a time because I realize that obedience is better than sacrifice. I have all kinds of plans, and I have all kinds of ways that I can serve him and that I can get things done and I can accomplish things for him and for his glory. But the truth is obedience is better than sacrifice. If I listen to the sound of his voice, if I could feel his heartbeat, then he will lead me and he will guide me and he will make a way where there is no way because all I have to do is trust him. Following Jesus is about trust. I guess the question we have to ask ourselves today is, do I trust him? Do I trust him in this season right now? Do I trust him in this situation? Do I trust him where I'm at? Do I trust him? Do I trust that, that if I follow him, that he will make a way? Do I trust him? Do I trust him? I also want to remind you before we continue in the text that on Christmas Eve, as Pastor DeAndre said, it's over 90%, it's 94%, which is amazing, 94% chance that if you invite somebody to church, they'll come. So it just gets better and better and better and better and better. And you're like, that doesn't get better. That means I have to invite somebody. <laughs> Correct. Correct. And so I just want to encourage you to bring somebody. I also need to let you know, though, that on December 24th, for both the 1030 and 12 p.m. service, uh, that... It's a family service, just like our normal Christmas Eve service, which means there's no kids ministry. All the parents are like, what? No, no, it's just like a normal Christmas Eve, except it's in the morning. We're not doing the night, we're doing the morning. And if you're like, you know what, 10.30 and 12 doesn't work for me here at Glastonbury, that's no problem. You can join us at 1.30 at Highlands, okay? 1.30 at Highlands, and you can join us over there. Yeah, come on. Uh, we have some of the Highlands team in the house today. They're like, all right, you can just come and join us over at Highlands, and it's fine. Uh, 
on that note, we do we are a family of churches. If you're new to Saints Church, we're a family of churches. We have a location right here in the West End, uh, and we're very creative. We named it after the neighborhood that we're in. So this is Saints Church Glastonbury. This is the Glastonbury neighborhood. We have another location out in Spruce Grove, Stony Plain, right on the highway, and that road is called Glory Hills Road. So we once again got incredibly creative, and we said, "What well, you know? What we should call it Saints Church Glory Hills because that's where it is." And then we launched a new location. We're like, you know what? What do we name this thing? It's got to have a name. We're like, oh, yeah, it's in the Highlands neighborhood, uh, St. Church Highlands. And that's on the east side. And that's at 630. So if you're a shift worker uh, and if you're like, hey, I can't make it on a Sunday morning, come out and join us. Or if you're like, hey, I know somebody that lives on the north side, northeast side, uh, or east side of Evanston Central. And you're like, man, I've always wanted to invite them to church, but this is too much of a drive. Well, you invite them there and you meet them there and uh, you help them get connected. And uh, wow, we're not even preaching yet, and DeAndre's already fired up. He's, he's so ready for today. Um, okay, let's jump into the Word. If you're with me today, say, I'm with you. Now, today, I know we're normally nice and we're polite, and we're, but you know, I think today uh, I could use a few amens. I could use a few shouts, you know, I could use, uh, you know, and then just save your questions for the youth pastor after the service. And uh, he's happy to answer all the questions for you, anything that you may have. Uh, he's ready, willing, and available. And uh, we're just going to be engaged. Hey, how many know it's okay? You can, you can enjoy church. I know that you've been, you thought you had to suffer. And maybe, maybe that's what it's like for you, but I'm hoping, you know, you could just try, let's just try this, because you don't get my view, and we won't put a camera, but there's not many smiles most of the time. <laughs> it's mostly just, I know you're processing, and like, that's what's happening, we're just processing, but mostly it's like this. <laughs> and then I say something that you're like... So if you thought that you need to suffer through church, just start to smile, and maybe your attitude will catch up to your face. And Because uh, this is two-way, right? And most of the time, how do you think this feels for me, okay? Just like, just, I want it, it would be nice to know that we were alive and active and living. And uh, so we're going in Scripture to Isaiah 7. You're like, well, normally have Scripture notes. Yeah, the QR code's not working, and... So all you have to do is if you want the notes for today, because there are notes for today, is you can go to the YouVersion Bible app. You hit the bottom three lines or dots, depending on the device that you have. We all know that Apple's the true device to own. The iPhone is the one to have. And uh, so you click on that, and, uh, and then you'll see events, and you'll see uh, St. Church Glastonbury there. It's live, and it should be uh, geolocated. So if you're sitting here, it should come up at the top, and you will get your sermon notes for today. Otherwise, you could be old school and take notes and write it on paper. And if you do that, I prefer you. Uh, anyways, Isaiah chapter, wow, I, okay. Desiree, Pastor Desiree, my wife, she's at Glory Hills today. So I can say whatever I want. And so I just, I guess I'm feeling that uh, freedom today. And normally we save this for Highlands. So we'll do it here. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, the Holy Scripture says, all right then, all right then, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. God is with us. This is the most underrated promise at Christmas time that we read about. We, we, we like to talk about wise men. We like to talk about shepherds. We like to talk about angels sing. We like to talk about baby Jesus wrapped in swaddly clothes, which we think is adorable, but it was in a barn and it was gross and it was nasty. And it was, we've romanticized this idea. We've basically made Hallmark Christmas movies in, in bad stage productions, but we've got an amazing one coming up here on the 15th and 16th. But we've, we've, we've romanticized this idea and we have maybe missed the point of Christmas, which is that Jesus came and he is Emmanuel, God with us. And once he showed up, he just stayed. And you're like, no, he went back up. No, let me, let me show you what I mean by he stayed. He stayed. You shall have a son and you will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Turn over in your Bible to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Now, Joseph needs some convincing that he should continue to be engaged to a woman who is now pregnant and her excuse is that God did it. 
And so he needs some convincing, and so God sends an angel to go, no, that's true. And it says, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Verse 23, look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son. He's quoting the scripture in Isaiah 7. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Now, you might be confused for a moment because you said, hold on. I thought you're supposed to name him Emmanuel. And the angel shows up and he says, you should call him Jesus. And if you call him Jesus, then you will fulfill the word that says Emmanuel, God with us. Is Emmanuel his middle name? Because Christ is his last name. No, Christ is not his last name. It's not it's his job. It's not his last name. It's fine. It's just like what we, okay, it's, that's another day. We'll do a podcast about it, okay? Here's what you need to understand. Emmanuel, which means God is with us. They named him Jesus. They named him Jesus. What does Jesus mean? For he will save his people from their sins. This is the Jewish Messiah coming, speaking to a Jewish man. Scripture first read and discovered by the Jewish people. Here's what they know that we don't know. Only God can save you from your sins. So when they say that his name is Jesus and his name means Jesus will save him from your sins, they go, oh, he's God. And when they realize that he's walking around and he's talking with them and he's hanging out, they go, oh, He's God with us. He's God with us. He's God with us. Last week I shared a thought, I shared, shared a, a suggestion, something for us to, comp, to contemplate, something for us to consider, and we are going to consider it again this week. I believe that the greatest gift that Jesus gave us was showing us how to live. The greatest gift that he could give us, that he did give us, was showing us how to live. And the greatest gift that we can give others, that we can give other people, is that we can live like Jesus. Amen? Amen. We can live like Jesus. It's the greatest gift. You can give all kinds of great stuff, but if you learn to live like Jesus, oh. You know what Scripture says about Jesus? He He grew in favor with God and with men. If people don't like you, start to live like Jesus. If you're like, wow, I need more friends, start to live like Jesus. If you want to take care of other people, start to live like Jesus. Now, what's really interesting is all throughout Scripture, we have moments and we have times where God shows up and he is tangibly with his people. And I don't know about you, but I think these moments are incredibly cool. We're going to just run them down, lots of verses today. It's a Bible study. Uh, We're just figuring out God with us. This happens in the Old Testament, then it shifts gears into the New Testament. Just go with me for a moment. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, this is the moment Adam and Eve are exposed, but we learn something actually about their relationship with God. We learn that they would walk and they would talk with God in the cool of the day. In Genesis 3, verse 8, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and Eve and his wife, sorry, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Adam and Eve would walk and talk with God in the cool of the day. And can I tell you, I think that is unbelievable. I think that's amazing. I'm like, God, how come we can't walk and talk in the cool of the day? How come you don't show up and go for a walk with me? Like, can we just start doing this? I feel like maybe I'd level up my life if I could walk and talk with God in the cool of the day. In Exodus chapter 13, there's this other kind of crazy cool moment. It says, the Lord went ahead of them. This is the Israelites. The Lord went ahead of them, and he guided them during the day with a pillar of cloud, and he provided a light at night with a pillar of fire. This allowed them to travel by day or by night. And the Lord did not remove the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire from its place in front of the people. So the Israelites... They leave Egypt. They come into the promised land, okay? They leave Egypt. They go into the promised land. On their way there, they're in a desert in between. They're on the in-between moment on the way to the promised land. And they're like, what do we do? Where do we go? How do we know? God shows up all day long. Giant cloud, amazing. Pillar of cloud. At night, pillar of cloud turns to fire, and the kids roast marshmallows. I don't think you get close, actually. It's just there. And then if, if it would move, you would move. You're like, God, I just, if man, I'm trying to make a major decision. Could you just send me like a pillar of cloud? He's like, yeah, your desk will fit right in your cubicle. Just a pillar of cloud. People are like, what are you smoking? Don't worry, it's Jesus. I think it's so cool. And then it starts to get more personal in Exodus chapter 33. 
Moses is still tasked with leading the people. They're still wandering. It goes on for decades. And, and Moses is talking with God in a personal way because it says that he would talk to God as if he was his friend. And this is what Moses asks. He's like, listen, I'm, I'm not going if you're not coming. And the Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. Come on. That's a good promise. You're going to give me rest and everything will be fine for me? Then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. So God is with them personally. His presence is there. Now, Moses had a protege. His name was Joshua. And Joshua would actually linger. It was called the tent of meeting. And, and Moses would go into there to pray and to meet God. And while everyone else was afraid to go there, Joshua, who's assistant, would actually go there and he would just hang out and he would watch and he would observe. And then after Moses would leave, Joshua would just linger a little longer because he just wanted to be close. He just wanted to be in the presence of God. It should be no surprise that those who linger longer learn and discover the heart and the plan and the purpose of God. And soon enough, Joshua becomes the one who's leading the people of God into the promised land. And he's like, God, how am I going to do this? Where are we going to go? How are we going to accomplish this? And in Joshua 1, it says this, God speaking to Joshua, I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set, fo set foot, you will be on land I have given you. From the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. So you're just going to take that. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. Whoa. For I will be with you as I was with Moses. Now watch this. You should underline this in a real paper Bible if you have it. I will not fail you or abandon you. Come on, that's a promise. But he ain't finished. Verse 9, this is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Whoa. Come on, that's good. You're like, they, man, they got all the awesome things in the Old Testament. Pillar of cloud. Pillar of fire. God in a meeting place. God saying, wherever you go, I'm with you. They get all the good stuff. They get God walking and talking in the garden in the cool of the day. They get all the good stuff. God, where are you? I need you right now. I'm making a decision. Do I go left? Do I go right? Do I accept the promotion? Do I not accept the promotion? Do I buy the house? Do I not buy the house? God. And he's like, listen, do you think about anything else other than yourself? No. Where are you? Because I think there's a piece of us that goes, if we just had them in a real, like, super tangible, like, right here kind of way, maybe that would help me. I don't know if you've read the Old Testament. It didn't help. They just kept doing their same thing. They did whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted. And they, were, they would have these moments where they just get, like, they get hungry, and God provides food in the middle of the desert where there's no, like, food source, and then they just complain. And then he adds protein, and they're like, can we get variety, though? <laughs> and he provides it day after day after day, and they have to, like, it's good enough for that day, and it spoils. They're like, this doesn't last. We can't preserve it. He's like, no, because I'm trying to teach you that I'm your provider, and I provide day after day after day after day after day. You don't have to worry. If you're with me, I'm with you. I am personally go with you wherever you go, and I'm going to take care of you day after day after day, moment by moment by moment by moment. It's good to plan ahead, but how many know it's good to walk with Jesus? Because he takes care of those things. God is with us. God is with us. God is with us. And then this moment happens in 2 Corinthians 13, and it's a question. In 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, is it, do you not know yourselves? Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? He's in me. I don't want him in me. I want him like over there in like a pillar of fire that I could just follow. God goes, no, I'm closer than you think. Ephesians 3, verse 17. So that Christ, this is the amplified, so we get all the words. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through your faith. And may you having been deeply rooted and securely grounded in love, be fully capable of comprehending with all saints, which are God's people, hence the name, 
the width and length and height and depth of his love, fully experiencing that amazing endless love, and that you may come to know practically through personal experience the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience, so that you may be filled up throughout your being to all the fullness of God, so that you may have the richest experience of God's presence in your lives, completely filled and flooded with God himself. Come on. A pillar of fire sounds nice because I can warm my hands. A pillar of cloud is nice because I can get some traffic lights and I can get some directions. Walking and talking with God in the cool of the day is nice, but that's once a day. You know what's better than once a day and over there leading me and guiding me is right here, right now. God is closer than you think in your heart, living with you in this moment day by day. You think it's cool to walk and talk with God in the cool of the day. Why don't you try talking with him at any time of the day? Because he's faithful and he's present and he's here and he's right now. And his promise doesn't stop there. You know that, uh, you ever notice when you're driving on a road trip? Anyone like summer road trips? Any summer road trip? I love summer road trips. I think I've successfully, it took a whole family, uh, but I think we successfully convinced Desiree to let us do a summer road trip this summer. And, uh, but what I noticed about road trips is that when you get into the mountains, all of a sudden, you don't have any cell service. You ever notice that? And it might be the best, but have you considered that at your moment of greatest possible need, there is no way to communicate to any human on earth? Like when I'm driving on a road trip and I drive through small town Alberta, I don't need cell service because there's somebody there with a landline. When I'm, when I'm driving through Edson, I just, I'll just stop at Arby's and, and use the phone, you know? You're like, why Arby's? Because I can get curly fries too. When I'm driving through a town or through a city, I, I, I know that there's all kinds of points of connection and connectivity. That's not the point in my journey that I need to be connected. The point in my journey that I need to be connected is up in the mountains where there is nobody, where there is no home, where there is no one that lives there, when it's just nothing but, but trees and rock and big sky and me alone broken down on the side of the road. That's when I need some connection. That's when I need some cell service. That's when, that's when I need someone to grab hold of me and be like, hey, you know, like, yeah, I'll come and help you right now. Not me just standing there flagging someone down. I need it right there. I need it when I'm alone. I need it when I'm just out there in the midst of nowhere, in the midst of nothing. And the truth is most of us live in the mountain range of life living largely disconnected, not understanding that you've had reception the entire time. Because God is with you. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus said, go and make disciples. And we focus on that part, but we forget the closing line. He says, and be sure of this. Be sure of this. I will be with you in Matthew 28, 20. I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. How often are you with me? Always. What if I'm in the mountains and I lack connectivity? You'll never lack connectivity because I'm with you always. Well, where are you? Right there in your heart. Well, how come I wasn't aware of this? You were. When you asked and I moved in, it sounded like this. Dear Jesus, I need you now more than ever. Remember that moment? When you prayed a prayer or some variation of it, when you gave your heart, you said, I'm going to trust Jesus. And Jesus said, listen, if you trust me, I'm going to come and I'm going to show up. I'm going to dwell in your heart through faith that you might be deeply rooted and securely grounded in love. Remember that moment when you went from feeling worthless and insecure and somehow you just felt like you were loved and that there was a plan and a purpose for you? That was the moment that he showed up. That was the moment you got cell service. See, Des and I just went to Slovenia recently. And, uh, you know, it's insane to pay roaming charges. It's insane. $16 a day? I don't think so. Now I can get an eSIM. It's like, what, what is an eSIM? I can just download it on my phone and I got cell service. It's a fraction of the cost. I can stay connected all the time. The truth is, the truth is, most of us live in analog faith world. Where we go, I come to church to meet Jesus and then I'm going to go, I'm going to go. 
And, and then we read these things, we're like, see, we like this because we like the idea that Jesus is right there. The reason why we like the idea that Jesus is right there is because I can come right over here. Oh, it's just me? You're like, I like Jesus when I need him. I like Jesus when I want him. I like Jesus when he's standing right over here. And I can get in proximity and I can get real close, but then when I'm kind of done or when I want to do my own thing, I can just step away and then I don't have to feel guilty and I don't have to worry about it because Jesus is just over there. I like to keep Jesus just right up over here because if Jesus is just right up over here, then I can, just, I can just slide away when it's convenient. But the truth is he dwells in my heart. He lives with me. He's right here. He's closer than you think. He's walking with you and he's leading you and he's guiding you and he's right right here. He's right up close. He's like the little thing that just like, he, like, he's just right here all the time. He's not following you. He's actually leading you the most of the time you think you're leading you. But there's those moments, there's those moments you're like, man, I think it's a coincidence that this thing just happened to me. No, you were just not listening. So he made it happen to remind you who's in charge. See, the greatest gift that God gave us is Emmanuel, God with us. And the greatest thing that he did was he exited stage left and went back to heaven so that he could shift our understanding of what it is for Jesus to be right here. Because we like the idea of Jesus as a person but we forget that Jesus lives right here within our person. He makes his home in our hearts. Which means that he's there in every moment. When you think you're alone, you're not. He's there. When you think you're lost, you're always connected. Here's the, maybe the most important thing. When you think you're not worth it, he's like, I'm still right here. I'm still right here. Because he doesn't see you the way that you see you. He doesn't judge you the way that you judge you. He's faithful to forgive. His mercies are new every morning. And those are just notes that he wrote and left in Scripture to remind you of his goodness. Now, there's implications for us of understanding that God is with us. Because if we go back to our thought that the greatest gift that Jesus gave was showing us how to live, then we should try and live like Jesus. Well, I, you know, how do I live like Jesus? We live the, the principle of Emmanuel, God with us. Okay, what does that mean? Emmanuel, God with us. This is not on the screen, so we don't have to worry about it. But if you've got a Bible, just join, join me in John 12, John 12, 32. Jesus speaking, he says, And when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He says, When I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He's speaking about being elevated on the cross and then ascending into heaven. When I'm lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. Now, here's what's really interesting about such statement is that when you think about Jesus and you think about him uh, drawing all people to himself, we really like this idea because we feel like it maybe takes the pressure off of us. You know, we're like, listen, it's so great that you're doing that, Lord. Even though you said when you left that we should go and make all disciples, I just want to remind you that you quoted in John 12, 32, that you're going to draw all people to yourself. So I don't got to invite them to Christmas Eve because you're just going to draw them in. That's why Pentecostals, we're the worst at this, actually. We pray these prayers. We say, dear God, dear Heavenly Father, bring in the buses from the streets, from every direction. May they come and meet us here at this place and be drawn by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would draw them to yourself, that cars on the hen day would just drive across this farmer's field and make their way here. And he goes, yeah, no, I'm going to draw all people to myself. Do you remember where I live? Yeah. 
Just remind me quick. Do you not know yourselves that Christ Jesus is in you? Oh, that was not a rhetorical question? No, that's a real question. Do you not know that Jesus Christ is in you? And that you, when you draw all people to yourself and you live here in me, that you Are you saying that I have a part to play in this? He's like, yeah, I kind of also said in Acts 1 that you'd be my witnesses to the ends of the earth, telling everybody about me. Yeah, 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 but I thought that was a short-term missions trip. (laughs) Emphasis on short-term. I do a week and I'm out. Generally to a warmer climate. says, no, I'm going to draw all men to myself, and I live in you. And that's a promise that you love. You love that I'm with you. You love that I'm right here right now. And I love that I'm right here right now. But I'm going to draw people to you. Because that hope in life and freedom that, 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 that you love so much, it's, it's available for them too. And I'm going to use you to let them know what this looks like, what this feels like, what this sounds like. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use you. Because you've been praying that I would use you. And then I bring people to you. And then your prayer is, God, why do you let people walk all over me? And because you've been praying, Lord, make me a bridge to the unbelievers. Like, why are they walking all over me? Because I answered your prayer. God, I just feel so used. Well, stop asking me to use you. I'm just answering your prayer. But God, those people hurt me. That's why I said you have to just keep forgiving and that my love is faithful. Okay, God, I'm out of excuses. So how do I live the promise of Emmanuel, God with us, to live like Jesus to give this gift that has been given to me? There's really two aspects. There's a practical aspect and there's a spiritual aspect. And depending on our personality type and spiritual gifting mix, we will gravitate to one or the other. But my suggestion today is that you allow Jesus to do both and work through you in this season. And it's also my encouragement to you to boldly invite somebody to church on Christmas Eve. Not because a pastor said so, but because at some moment and some time, your life was changed because somebody had the courage to invite you. You're like, no, it was my mom. She kept bringing me. Yeah, she had the courage to put up with her complaining every day. Put you in the car and said, it doesn't matter what you think. Let's start with the practical. Applying the principle of Emmanuel, God with us, operating through our lives. What does this look like? Great question. Romans 12, verse 15 says this. Rejoice with those who rejoice, sharing others' joy. And weep with those who weep, sharing others' grief. What does the principle of Emmanuel, God with us, look like for us as believers today? Simple. We show up. We show up. We don't run away from the mess, we run towards the mess. Why? Because we're not afraid of a little chaos because we understand that the Holy Spirit, just like he did at creation, he took the chaos and he brought it into order that that's what he does and that he's with me. And that when I walk into a situation that's messy and chaotic, he's gonna, by the power of his Holy Spirit, come and bring that which is out of order and put it back into order. But I'm gonna show up. I'm going to show up and I'm going to celebrate with those who are celebrating. I'm going to weep and I'm going to mourn with those who are mourning. Why? Because everybody needs somebody and that person can be you. Let's ramp, let's ramp it up. Let's up the ante. That's the easy one. You're like, but I don't know what to say when somebody's, oh, I should just say this. I don't know what to say when somebody's grieving. Don't use it. Don't use some phrase that you heard from somebody. You're going to make it worse. 
Don't use some random line that you saw on a Hallmark movie that you thought explained the situation well. You can't explain it. You just say, I'm right here. And I love you. Gently and humbly help that person back onto the path. And, this is an important part, and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. If you are think that you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself, you are not that important. Devin, if we could just bring the overall level of band down just a little touch, because what I need to say, I need everybody to hear. I need them to hear it clearly. Our position as followers of Jesus has been that when we see sin, we generally stand up and we walk the other way, and then we stand over here and we condemn, especially if it's the sin of a, of a believer we kind of forget that all are sinners and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. But when somebody gets caught in it, we go, see, see, see. And we stand in a corner and we pray for them, which is the Pentecostal way of saying we talk about them and we let the Lord deal with them or her. The scripture says, if another believer is overcome by sin, you, you who are godly, not stand in the corner and let God do his thing, but you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. Now, the reason why that second part's important and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself is because you've been there. Maybe you didn't get caught, but you've been there. So we're present. Why? Because Jesus was present. Romans 5 says that Jesus came at just the right time while we were still his enemies. So while you think he came for church loving you, Jesus loving, I thank God singing you, he came from ugly, broken, nasty enemy you. And he still came. And he's still here. He says, share each other's burdens. Share each other's burdens share each other's burdens. And if you think you're too important to help somebody, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. How do we know that we actually have this mentality? It's when we say, I don't have time for this. Make time. Romans 12, 21, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. more often than not is the evil that says it's not my problem it's the practical steps we show up we're present we're here to help get this this is the spiritual aspect this is how you're going to do it Isaiah 11 and the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, speaking of Jesus, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in obeying the Lord. Get this, he will not judge by appearance or make a decision based on hearsay. So how do we do this practically? Well, first thing, most of us make decisions based on hearsay. Scripture is very clear about having witnesses trying to figure out what actually happened instead of just talking about what you think happened. There's actually a word for that. It's listed as a sin. It's called gossip. So if you're participating in that behavior, you are as guilty as the person you're chatting about. Because the Lord does not judge by appearance. 
This is a, an amazing statement, and it's a callback to when David was selected as king. He says, I don't judge the way that you judge. I don't look on the outward appearance. I look on the heart. So we show up, and we're present because we know it could have been us, and we know that God is faithful to forgive. We show up, and we're there to gently get them back on the path. Oh, you're like, well, I don't know if we can do it gently. Do you know what they've done? Yeah, I know what they've done, and I know what I, you know, I have some thoughts about what you could have done as well. But the reality is we're going to gently get them back on the path. We're going to love them back to life. You're like, oh, I don't think we can love them. we got to punish them. Well, thank God you're not Jesus Christ. if that was his premise, he wouldn't have showed up for any of us. So I'm going to live like Jesus. And you're like, but what about speak the truth in love, pastor? Well, by your tone, I'm judging that you forgot the love part. Band's back. Three quick thoughts. The way that we do this requires the same thing that the Spirit of God gave to Jesus. So we're going to live like Jesus, and this is the gift that keeps on giving because it's the gift of mercy and grace. When you're walking with somebody, another believer overcome by sin, how do you do it? Number one, you need wisdom and understanding. That's what it says right here in Isaiah 11. Wisdom and understanding. When you combine them together, it means you require great wisdom. Second thing that you need is counsel and might. That's what it describes in Isaiah 11, verse 2. Counsel and might. The spirit of counsel and might. What is counsel and might? It's a strategy from heaven. First you need the plan, then you need the courage to execute the plan. It's how you get them back on track. The last thing that you need is the set of tools that you are given. From Isaiah chapter 11 the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. You need knowledge and fear. When we find these put together in scripture in this language in this way, it's acknowledgement of the Lord, awareness of his power and his might. It's also loyalty to the Lord. So I submit this to you greatest gift that you could give this Christmas is grace. Like they don't deserve it. The Bible definition of grace is undeserved favor. You're going to need wisdom. You're going to need a plan. But when there's a mess and a cleanup on aisle nine, we don't run the other way, we run towards it. Because God is with us and I'm a carrier of his presence. And some of the ways that God shows up is using his people to show up at just the right time, at just the right moment, this Christmas. Would you consider living the principle of Emmanuel, God, 